Okay, so in this video, we're going to be going through a paper called Quality Minus Junk, and it's by Asnes, Frazzini, and Peterson. And so historically and in prior academic research, um, companies that exhibit um, characteristics of quality, for instance, um, profitability, um, better balance sheets, more growth, um, et cetera, uh, less volatility of um, earnings and price, um, all those companies tend to outperform companies with lower levels of that those characteristics. And so the authors here are going to explore um, this occurrence in the same vein that Alma French did with um, uh, value versus growth, big minus small, um, so on and so forth. But in this case, it's going to be quality minus junk. All right, so first we have table one um, that has a few summary statistics for us to um, help us understand the characteristics of the data we're going to be looking at. Um, it spans the June 1957 to December 2016 period. Um, it has 24 developed markets. And it actually represents uh, a little over 54,000 stocks, most of which looks like it comes from the United States. And we see here that the data goes back to 1957 for the U.S., but generally for the other countries, it starts um, in the mid-90s, mid-1990s. So the authors have suggested that investors, when they are um, analyzing a company or deciding the value or whether uh, what the return should be in the future, they're implicitly looking to the future um, of that company. And so in that vein, um, the investor should also look to the future quality of that company, not necessarily the quality of the company today. So here with table two, they want to look at the persistence of quality measures to see if um, an investor would be able to look at the quality of the company as today, and um, it would tell them something about the future quality of the company. So what they've done is sorted the um, portfolios, in this case, um, U.S. stocks, they have the global stocks down here in this panel B, but they put them into 10 um, deciles according to their level of quality. And they summarize how they build this quality measure in section two, um, but we're going to skip over that and just look at it from a high level perspective. Um, their quality measures contain um, the profitability of the company. So they've used a lot of profitability measures, for instance, um, uh, return on equity, return on assets, um, gross profit. So growth, um, they use the change in all of those profitability measures. So um, the delta of um, gross profit, return on assets, return on equity, et cetera. And then finally, the level of safety um, depends on market beta, um, bankruptcy, risk, return on equity, volatility, and a few others. So anyway, those um, factors boil into this quality measure. And so they've, the authors have sorted um, the measure of quality into deciles with um, high quality stocks being over here in the tenth, top 10th tenth decile, low quality stocks being in the low um, decile. And then, so to see if these quality measures are persistent over time, um, they've also um, taken these original sorts and looked at what were um, the average quality measures at 12 months, 36 months, 60 months, 120 months in the future. And they find that companies with high uh, quality measures um, tend to um, have high quality um, up to 10 years in the future. And the same goes for low quality. Um, they tend to have lower quality 10 years into the future. And so we still generally have monotonic increases in the level of quality um, for each of the, the subsequent years. So um, that would tell us that um, quality seems to be persistent. So high quality high quality today predicts high quality in the future. Okay, so next the authors want to understand the price of quality here at table three. And what does that mean? That means that how much higher prices do companies garner from having higher quality? So let's go down to the table down here. And this is a couple of regressions. We see here that we have um, the US sample um, for data from 1957 to 2016. And we also have the global sample, which is from 1989 through 2016. Now, for each of these markets, we have six different regressions, and they each control for uh, different variables. So this first one is, well, this line is the most important to us in our study. And uh, so each of these six regressions on each market contains quality. Um, but then some are controlled for industry factors. Some of them are controlled for country factors, especially in the global side here, and uh, for firm factors. And then we're also including in um, some other explanatory variables that have been shown in other studies to affect the price of company. So what each of these variables tells us is for one standard deviation change in this variable, this is the percentage amount of increase to the market to book ratio. So what effect do each of these items have on the company's price? And we see here in all instances that the quality, the higher the company's quality rank, according to what we saw in the prior tables, the higher the company's price to book ratio. So higher quality companies garner a higher price. So now let's take a, a look at a few other ones. Um, this, this, these right here are quality by themselves. So quality alone 
contributes to about 10% of the variation in price to book ratios. So that means 90% of the variation in price to book ratios are um, from other variables. And we see here that adding in these other variables increases this R squared, um, but we still always have less than 50% of variation and price to book ratio is explained. So um, there's a lot of different other factors besides these that are contributing to um, the variation in um, the company's price to book ratio. But uh, we see that quality does um, provide a good means of explaining the price to book ratios, even whenever we're controlling for other factors. So for instance, here we have uh, with firm size, larger companies tend to garner a larger price relative to um, the company's book value. Also, the past one year return is positively related to the price to book ratio, and that's probably because um, the high return of the prior year increases the price piece while the book value has remained uh, or hasn't had a chance to change yet. And we also see that um, older firms have lower price to book ratios. Um, firms with more profit uncertainty have higher price to book ratios. Um, dividend payers tend to have lower price to book ratios. And these items are all statistically significant, even when we control for different industry or firm factors. Although adding these um, industry and firm country factors does increase um, the R squared. So there's a certain explanatory power in here of the firm country and industry factors. So next, um, here the authors want to um, build on the prior table, which was panel B. This is now, or panel A, this is now panel B. Um, we have the same study, only this time the authors split the quality factor into its three components of profitability, growth, and safety um, to see if maybe each of the components have a particularly significant explanatory power on their own. And we see here that that's the case. Certainly all of them have um, positive and statistically significant um, coefficients here. So the higher the profitability, the higher the growth, the higher the safety of the companies on average, um, the higher is the price to book ratio. And we see that um, we have some higher, uh, well, based on these R squareds, these um, different regressions um, explain almost 50% of the variation in price to book ratios. Um, even when these different quality components are on their own, as well as combined and controlled against each other. Okay, so next, um, to understand how much um, company size affects the quality score, um, or rather the price of, of companies, in conjunction with their quality score, the authors have formed um, the same regression as before, only they've split up the companies into deciles according to size. So we have larger companies over here in P10, smaller companies over here in P1, and the same goes for the broad sample, the global stocks here. And we see that um, in the larger companies, the price to book ratio is more affected by the company quality than it are the smaller companies. So in the smaller companies, uh, quality doesn't seem to matter as much in the prices, although it does ha hold a significant coefficient here. So it does matter somewhat, but not as much as um, it does in larger companies. So when we're dealing with larger companies, um, the higher quality companies out of those large companies tend to garner a larger price uh, to book ratio than do um, the smaller companies. Right, and so as we saw in the prior tables, quality um, and some of the other factors only explain up to 40 or 50 percent of the um, prices of the stocks under study. So the authors want to understand um, why is that, and maybe there are some other factors that might um, contribute to this phenomenon, and also um, maybe there's some market efficiency. So here at table four, they've sorted the stocks according to quality deciles. So we have high quality stocks in decile P10 and low quality stocks in P1. And we have a couple of descriptors here. The excess return is the return of the stocks minus um, T-bill rates. So you see here that it, as the quality of the stocks increases, um, the higher return we get per month uh, relative to um, T-bills. And we see that the highest quality stocks earned um, 40 basis points more per month than the lowest quality stocks relative to the T-bills. And now we also have the alpha relative to um, the CAPM the three-factor model and four-factor model. So the CAPM is basically the return of the stocks minus a um, market factor. So this is the return in excess of the market um, relative to um, the risk of the securities. And also we have a three-factor model. So this would include um, the CAPM, which has the market factor plus the Fama French um, value factor. So value stocks minus growth stocks and the size factor. So small stocks minus um, large stocks. And then the four-factor model adds in momentum. So it's these three factors plus a momentum factor of the up minus down. So prior positive returns minus prior negative return. So these are three commonly used models for explaining um, the returns 
And so the authors want to see, well, how much of these returns are explained by these factors and how much is not explained by these factors, and that would be the alpha. And so what we find over here is that as the quality of the companies increases, so it goes from P1 to P10, um, we get a higher and higher alpha relative to each of these models. So, so this is the return of this decile um, after controlling for uh, the market returns. And this is the return of these deciles after controlling for size and for value and for market factors. And then this is the return of these um, deciles after controlling for market size, value, and momentum factors. So these figures are what can't be explained by these particular models and represent possibly um, a quality factor. So these, among other things, that aren't included in these models. And we see here that higher quality deciles have much higher alphas than do low quality deciles. And you can get an excess return of 60 to 104 basis points um, over and above these commonly used models um, when investing in higher quality companies rather than lower quality companies. And we see, um, as we would expect, as the quality of the company increases, so does the beta decrease. So the market risk is going down. We also see an increase in sharp ratios. So returns relative to the volatility of those returns is going up as we get more quality companies. And we see a very significant R squared here where um, these models and the regression um, explain a pretty big portion of the variation in uh, returns. And going down to panel B, we have um, the global sample, and we see the same phenomenon, whereas quality increases, so do the excess returns over T-bills, um, but also so, so do the alphas after controlling for each of the factors in these models. So that would tell us that there is something, some kind of factor, other than these, um, other than the market um, size, momentum, or value that are explaining these returns, and likely it's the company quality. Okay, so now that we saw in the previous table that um, there was an alpha for the returns after accounting for cap and model, the three-factor, four-factor model, then authors want to see, well, um, is this other factor that may absorb that alpha, maybe that factor is a quality factor. So they've created a quality minus jump factor in the same way that Palma French did, where it's uh, high minus low, um, small minus big, etc. So they've um, ranked the the um, stocks into quality and thirds, so one third um, high quality, middle quality, and low quality. And they've also split those into small and big companies. So when they say quality minus junk, they're saying they're going long. The top quality um, stocks that are the average of the small and the large ones. And then they're going short um, the least quality third of stocks, um, and with those being the average of the smallest and largest. If they didn't average the small and the large for each um, category, then the larger stocks might get a larger representation. So um, by doing so, they're giving a chance for the smaller companies to um, have a bigger representation than they otherwise would if they didn't average the small and the largest ones. So think about this as the the most the companies with the uh, best quality minus the companies with the worst quality and the returns that would result if you went long quality and short junk. So first, they want to show you the correlations between each of the individual quality components. So we remember that their quality factor, overall quality, was composed of profitability, safety, and growth. And so they want to show here that each of these smaller components that wraps into the larger one are actually um, fairly co um, correlated with the returns of the overall factor. Because um, we see we have pretty high correlations here with the Q minus J factor, um, not only with excess returns over the T bill, but also um, the alpha after the four-factor model. So we can conclude from these correlations that um, if a company is high in one of these component factors, profitability, safety, or growth, then they're likely high in the other factors as well. And so the authors want, for ease of analysis and um, presentation, the authors have decided to just use the overall quality measure, which is composed of each of these individual ones, um, in lieu of um, presenting the individual um, components. So then next here in table six, authors want to see how would um, a portfolio of going long quality and going short junk stocks, uh, what would be the returns to running a portfolio like that? So we go down and we have some um, statistics here. So first off, uh, similar to the prior tables we've looked at, we have the US sample from 1957 to 2016. And then over here we have the uh, global sample um, from 1989 to 2016. We also have here the excess returns of each of these factors um, which would be the returns in excess of 
the um, T-bill, and then we also have the returns in excess of the CAPM, in excess of the three-factor model, which was this includes, um, well, the CAPM includes the market factor, and then the three-factor model has market plus value plus um, size factors, and then the four-factor model adds um, the three-factor model plus momentum. And so we see in all cases that um, when we employ a portfolio of um, going long quality companies and going short junk, co junk companies, we get a significant alpha after controlling for T-bills, the market, or um, three-factor, four-factor models. And we see that it's not just the individual components of uh, quality, but overall quality um, does really well also. And that works not only in the U.S., but also globally where we have um, significant um, alphas here. And what's also interesting to see is how um, the, the different factors in the four-factor model turned out as well, um, where we have market factor, small minus big, which is the size factor, high minus low, which is the value factor, and then up minus down, which is the momentum factor. And we see that all of these are generally negative and statistically significant. So uh, each of these factors, or rather each of the coefficients of these uh, factors um, affect the returns of the quality minus junk portfolio um, negatively, inversely. And this would make sense because um, if we're going long quality companies and short junk companies, uh, we would likely be buying um, companies with low betas to the market. Um, so that's why these figures are negative here. Um, also, as we've seen in prior tables, quality companies tend to be much larger. So this factor is negative when we go long quality and short junk. Um, also, high minus low, um, when we buy quality companies and go short junk companies, uh, the quality side is likely very high priced companies, so potentially growth companies, as we saw in a prior table as well, where the price to book ratio is higher for higher quality companies. And also the momentum seems to be a little bit less um, significantly negative. But as we suggested in a prior table, um, companies, well, let's just leave it that these um, variables are fairly insignificant. And so all of uh, what we just discussed in relation to the U.S. is also the same um, for globally, which includes several different companies. So let's go down to um, this next panel C, which includes all the 23 countries and the global figure. And we see that out of all the 24 countries in, under the study, um, there was only one country that did not show an alpha um, after controlling for the four-factor model. And that was New Zealand, which represents the smallest in market capitalization and number of stocks under study. Also, these four factors are um, statistically significant in 17 of the 24. So all of these that are bold are statistically significant. So only a few of them um, we might would conclude is not significantly different from zero. Um, but 17 is a large portion of 24. So we can see that, say that the, the quality factor is pervasive across um, several markets. And so to make the results of Table 7 more clear, um, authors have put the uh, results into figures. And so here we see the alpha of the four factor models for the quality minus junk portfolios. Um, we see that they're all positive except New Zealand, which we discussed. Um, we can see that these are all fairly large alphas, except uh, a few that are a bit small. Um, but also, going down to figure two, we have here the, the cumulative returns to the quality minus junk factor. So this is a accumulation of the alpha. Um, excuse me, this shows the excess returns above the T-bill. So this is a return to the going long quality and going short junk companies in excess of um, the T-bill rate. And so we see a pretty consistent um, smooth ride up here. So no particular period is particularly telling or um, resulting in all of the returns. Here we have the broad global, global sample, um, which is the excess return above the T-bill rate over this time period for the global stocks. Down in figure three, we have the alpha above the four-factor model. So this is the return to going long quality stocks and going short junk stocks after taking into account the market return, uh, returns to value, returns to size, and returns to momentum. So we have a, a pretty smooth ride up here as well. And here's the global sample. So pretty significant accumulation of excess returns above the T-bill rate and above the uh, four-factor model. So next, as a robustness check, the authors uh, perform the same analysis uh, um, regarding the going long quality companies, going short junk companies. Only this time, they're looking at the excess returns above a six-factor model. And so the six-factor six model is um, similar to the three and four-factor model, only we're adding, for instance, we're taking the four-factor model, which is the market size, value, and momentum, and we're adding two other factors. The investment factor, which is um, conservative minus aggressive, and this is where um, it's been found that companies that are more conservative with their um, investments, for example, um, capital purchases end up uh, returning more, and also companies that are more profitable that have robust minus weak profitability um, tend to earn more also. So then even after adding in 
all uh, these two factors. Um, we have six um, factors that are explaining the returns. Even after these six factors, um, we still get an excess return over and above the return of each of these factors with the quality minus junk portfolio. And it's interesting to see also that um, there's a significant positive loading on the robust minus weak profitability factor. And that's because basically um, it represents about the same thing as our quality minus junk factor does um, with one of the components being profitability. So that's why um, this absorbs some of the uh, variability and returns. But even after, even with that, we're also seeing, we're still seeing significance over here. And even on the global side as well. Um, and we still have the negative scenarios that we saw um, previously to the market size and value factors. And momentum still has somewhat of a, an insignificant part or explanatory power in the returns to the quality minus junk portfolio. Okay, so now that we know the quality minus junk uh, portfolio earns us significantly excess returns even after uh, controlling for one to, to seven factors or one to six factors. We uh, authors want to understand what happens in different regimes. So for instance, recessions, fair markets, um, higher low volatility environments. So they've performed the same analysis, only they split the um, data up into particular periods. So um, this line is all the periods, but then they've also split it into recessions and expansionary periods and also into severe bear markets, um, severe bull markets, high and low volatility, and then spikes up and down in volatility. And what's interesting to see is that the uh, QMJ factor is basically insignificant during um, bear markets. So maybe the low beta is um, a hedge against uh, the bear market. And also we see that in expansion um, where our alphas here are a little bit depressed compared to in the recessionary period where they do well. So quality minus junk portfolio tends to be a hedge against um, severe bear markets or uh, recessions. And that makes sense because the companies um, composed of in the portfolio going long in the portfolio are um, considered to be a little more safe. And this works the same way in the, the global sample as well, um, where in recessions, we've got some, some more excess return than we do in the expansions. So next, the authors want to understand um, the price of quality and how it's changed over time. And that's here at figure six. Um, so what this is, is it's plotting the um, quality coefficient on the regression we did where the uh, price to book ratio is the dependent variable and the quality factor is the independent variable. So a higher um, factor here would say that the, the price to book ratio is affected more by the measure of quality. So for instance, higher quality companies um, would have higher, higher price to book ratios. So in times when this coefficient is higher, then so are the price to book ratios. And we can see when we go down here, the trend, um, just based on our knowledge of different events throughout the history of the U.S. stock market. Uh, for instance, here we're coming into the internet bubble, and so the price of quality is fairly small relative to history. So that might tell us that investors were relatively um, unconcerned with the level of quality of companies in the stock market. But once we got into the um, bursting of the internet bubble, we say that quality became much more important and much more expensive as a result. Uh, same scenario um, as we have the run up into the housing bubble, quality was rel relatively cheap. Um, and then after the bubble burst, um, quality becomes um, very much sought after and so more expensive. And now that we understand kind of the, the trend of, of the price of quality over time, the authors want to understand, well, um, is the returns to quality, could we earn more returns to quality if we bought um, when the price of quality was cheap? So for example, is um, are the returns to quality higher here than they would be here? Okay, and so as some additional analysis on why uh, maybe quality um, stocks tend to earn more than junk stocks, um, and in the face of the theory would suggest that quality stocks should earn less um, than junk stocks. The authors have looked at analyst recommendations and target prices based on the different um, deciles of quality. So this is the United States here, and then this is global. And the first line is the, basically the price to book ratio. And we see that, um, as we found in prior tables, um, higher quality stocks tend to have higher um, price to book ratios. We see that here. And then here we have the um, analyst expectations of target prices and the resulting expected return um, based on that target price above the current price. And these are basically price to book ratios. Um, so we see that analysts um, typically give a higher price to book ratio for um, companies with higher quality, as we see that this is an increasing line here. And um, but they're giving a less and less implied expected return um, as a company um, gets to a higher decile in quality, which is counter to 
what we've seen and the other tables where we found that higher quality uh, companies tend to outperform lower quality companies. And in fact, we see here the realized future return um, actually increases as the quality increases. Well, it kind of gets a little lower in these top two deciles, but this is counter to what um, analysts had predicted. And the same result um, appears in global stocks as well. So the authors suggest that um, since our portfolio is long quality and short jump, maybe these analysts and investors are also if analysts are considering that higher quality stocks should return less because they're safer, then possibly the current market prices do not reflect a high as, or as high of a price to book ratio as they should um, to re reflect that safety. And if they did reflect a higher price to book, then they could earn a lower required return as the um, analysts are expecting. But instead, maybe these price to book ratios are lower than they should be in light of that quality. And so they earn some excess returns over and above what is required by the market or analysts. Okay, so to understand how the price of quality um, affects future returns, um, the authors have prepared this regression here. This is the return to um, owning the quality minus junk portfolio that's going long um, quality stocks and going short um, junk stocks. And then we have over here two independent variables plus an error and an intercept. Our first independent variable is the lagged price of quality. So if the authors are correct in their thought process that um, a higher price of quality results in lower um, returns to quality going forward, then we would expect this, um, this beta here to be negative. And so in the same vein, if um, quality is cheap um, in the previous lag period, then we would expect um, a positive or rather a higher return um, to quality going forward. So we expect a negative relationship um, between the price of quality and the future returns of quality. And they've also got here a momentum term to control out the effect that might be had of prior momentum. That way we might not mistake the results of this um, by saying there is a connection here between price of quality and quality, when in fact there's it's just momentum that is coming through. And by controlling for this momentum, uh, we might discover there is a true connection here, even after um, controlling for the momentum piece. So here in table 10, we have the results of that regression, um, where we're wanting to see whether the a higher price of quality predicts lower uh, returns to quality going forward. And down here we have each of the coefficients on the price of quality term. So as we discussed, um, we should have a negative term here because a higher price of quality should result in lower returns. And that's exactly what we see in all cases. And these are returns um, for different time periods. So up to one year, three years, and five years um, for both US and global companies. And so we see in all cases, at least in the US, except one, this small t statistic here, uh, in all cases, we have a negative uh, relationship between price quality and returns to quality. And uh, these are all statistically significant. So we can reject the null hypo hypothesis that this um, this coefficient here is zero. And you can also see here we have the um, the um, excess return over the uh, risk-free rate, which is the T-bill. We also have the alpha after considering the four-factor model. And so controlling for size, um, value, momentum, and market Factors. We still have an excess uh, relationship between the price of quality and um, the returns to quality. And that happens over on the global side as well, um, although not as significant in some cases. Um, as time goes on, um, our returns over five years, we have much larger coefficients than in shorter time periods. So it generally takes a while for this um, uh, phenomenon to carry out. Okay, so now that we understand the um, results of having the QMJ on the left side of the regression, so when it's a dependent variable, we also want to see, well, what happens when we have the QMJ on the right side of the regression, so when it's an independent variable. And we have that down here at table 11. And for each of these, we have the standard Bama French factors, the small minus big, high minus low, and uh, up minus down. So size, value, and momentum. We have that for each of the um, US and the global samples. So this rep these represent the dependent variable on the left side of the regression. And then all of these are on the right side, the independent variables. And what the authors are trying to get at is this highlighted area here. So when we're regressing on company size without the QMJ, as an explanatory variable, we see we have an alpha um, that's very insignificant, T statistics below two. And so, so this size factor um, basically um, is non-existent, or rather the size factor uh, fails to explain um, excess returns. However, when we control for the QMJ factor where we add it here, um, it reacts negatively um, to the size and it resurrects the size alpha here for 
um, sample. And this makes sense because more quality companies tend to be larger. So when we pull this um, quality piece out and control for the quality, um, the size factor is resurrected. So smaller companies outperform larger companies irrespective of um, their quality. Um, the same thing happens for the high minus low, the value factor, where the alpha was um, increased after we added the quality factor. And this is because quality companies um, tend to have higher price to book ratios, or they might be um, considered glamour companies or growth companies. So when we add in the quality factor, we're pulling that um, out of the equation, and we see that um, value companies um, outperform growth companies um, when we control um, for the quality factor.